uh, sure ma'am yeah okay okay the mind of god we believe is cosmic music the music of strings resonating through 11 dimensional hyperspace that is the mind of god good morning to everyone on behalf of department of physics i extend my warm welcome to you all to this international webinar on two dimensional lego now i would like to welcome the person who is always with us he is a man of great motivation and always motivating us conducting such for conducting such events and he is none other than our respected principal dr e zaram zavier indian academy degree college autonomous i welcome you sir thank you ma'am now i also request you sir kindly welcome and introduce our today's resource person dr sanjay vevra over to you sir respected participants of the international seminar that is being organized by the department of physics under the leadership of dr banita a very resourceful person young and dynamic dr sanjay behura research scholars and students it is really heart heartwarming to see that the department of physics within a short period of 2 to 3 weeks has once again organized an international webinar keeping in mind to stimulate research culture and inquisitive mind in the field of physics to the teaching fraternity of physics professors i'm sure the students and the research scholars as well will be benefited by this kind of international webinars which is not an easy task i am glad dr sanjay behura who is the keynote speaker and the resource person for the webinar was kind enough to give his consent although he is far away from us physically he is very much present with us this morning very pleasant to see you dr behura indian academy degree college autonomous which is run by the indian academy education trust is an autonomous institution for the last 6 years and it takes all trouble to ensure that the teaching community is constantly given a kind of igniting their minds innovative ideas and bringing them into the fold of research and innovation being that as the primary objective we have been conducting a team number of webinars in all the areas it's not only physics chemistry biotechnology microbiology genetics and so on and this pandemic period has helped us to be in touch with people like you who are abroad but yet you are still connected to india very much in your heart and mind dear participants to introduce an eminent personality like dr sanjay behura is an honor at this young age he has great credentials in academics and research he is an assistant professor of physics at the university of arkansas pine bluff united states of america his research areas span from design synthesis of two dimensional materials and engineered heterostructures to optoelectronics and renewable energy conversion dr behura has published 36 research articles in the peer reviewed outstanding reputed international journals that includes nature phonetics acs nano 
JECS, nano letters, renewable and sustainable energy reviews, and so on. He is a co-inventor of three US patent applicant applications to his credit, and he has co-authored a, a book chapter in Royal Society of Chemistry. What an honor indeed, Dr. Behura. We are delighted to have you this morning. Dr. Behura also has received several awards, including Young Scientist, Young Scientist Travel Award, Canada Commonwealth Graduate Scholarship, and Best Science Graduate Award. Dr. Behura serves as an editorial board member of Scientific Reports and co-editor of Special Issue on Heterostructured Optoelectronics in Emergent Materials. Prior to joining UAPB, he was working as a research assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He has mentored two PhD scholars, six MS graduate students, and 10 undergraduate students. Currently, he is monitoring both undergraduate and postgraduate students. It is very important to note that Dr. Sanjay Behura has an outstanding achievement in terms of research projects. Total amount of funding leading to 12 lakhs, $200 to his credit for almost 11 projects. Congratulations, Dr. Sanjay. It is a great achievement for an Indian to do that in USA. As I said, we are delighted to have such an outstanding research scholar, eminent scientist, and more than that, at this young age, you have achieved such a lot which is going to be a great motivation for the physics lecturers as well as research scholars particularly. And I'm hoping that this webinar will be very, very fruitful, not only to our institution, but to participants who have joined from other parts of India as well as the globe. Thank you, Dr. Begra. On behalf of the Indian Academy Education Trust, the management, the principal and the staff, once again, I extend a very warm welcome and I am grateful to you for being with us this morning. Over to you, Dr. Behura. Thank you very much, Dr. Jabir. It is a really kind and a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Behura, for the invitation. Uh, I'm really honored to be here this morning uh, with you all. And uh, thank you very much uh, once again for the invitation. I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see my screen now. Yes, Dr. Sanjay, we could see. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Okay. <coughs> Great. And the, thank you very much for all the faculty members uh, of the uh, Indian Academy Degree College and the graduate students. Uh, and. Uh, and all the other students, those who are participating. Uh, today, I am going to talk about uh, the research that I am uh, working on for the past 10 years. Uh, those are uh, two dimensional materials. I'm going to talk about how we can build uh, a two dimensional Lego. So we have uh, played with, uh, in our childhood, we have played with uh, Lego, which are three dimensional, as you can see here. Let me get the screen. So we, we, we all our kids are, are you know, building this three-dimensional Lego. And uh, what I'm going to talk today is a kind of uh, Lego. However, these are just consist of two-dimensional uh, materials here. You can see my three-year kid this evening has made this Lego. And uh, this is something what uh, I am also working on creating 
uh, Lego out of uh, atomically thin two dimensional materials. And I will also share with you how these structures, which we call engineered heterostructures or, or artificial materials that you will not be able to find uh, outside. So you will not be able to find naturally. So these materials are engineered materials and how these structures can be useful for energy conversion, which is my primary area of research. Uh, before I uh, forget, I would like to thank the team and the funding agencies and the collaborators that have helped so far in my research. So uh, all my research uh, funding agencies, uh, students and collaborators, uh, I thank them for their support. And uh, before I uh, start my research, uh, I'd like to talk about, uh, about my institute my university that I uh, recently, this semester I moved from Chicago. So I am in state of Arkansas, as you can see here in the United States. And uh, then uh, in Arkansas, I am uh, at, in the city called uh, Pine Bluff, which is close to Little Rock, which is the capital city of Arkansas. And it's about 30 miles, 30 to 40 miles from the capital, which is Pine Bluff and uh, where uh, it's my University of Arkansas at Fine Club. And I'm in the uh, School of Arts and Sciences, and I am affiliated with uh, chemistry, physics, mathematics, and computer science. I'm also affiliated with the uh, Photonics uh, Center. Uh, as you can see here, this is a, a research center, a research uh, lab and the center uh, that uh, works on federally funded uh, research programs from Army, Navy, uh, 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 Defense, and also National Science Foundation and other uh, funding agencies like NASA. So where we work on uh, designing new materials for lasers, solar cells, photo detectors, and other optoelectronic uh, devices. And we do have uh, fantastic facilities as you can see here temperature dependent uh, Raman spectroscopy in our in our lab and also a world-class microwave photonic setup that uh, uh, that uh, is just recently uh, uh, commissioned its setup and then we have electron microscopy and also temperature dependent photoluminescence spectroscopy in our lab in addition to other other equipments like you know, nuclear magnetic resonance gas chromatography UV for with photo uh, photo spectrometer, FTIR, and other uh, photovoltaic and electrical characterization facility. And we do have uh, numerous collaborations. We do. Uh, we have nearby University of Arkansas, the main campus, and the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, UMS, where we do collaboration on medical science uh, part of the research. Then we have University of Arkansas Little Rock, and also NCTRF, uh, FDA. Uh, affiliated national lab uh, for toxicological research. With this, now I'll uh, move to uh, two of my research uh, programs that I will uh, talk this morning. Uh, one is about uh, designing uh, materials uh, at the atomic scale and how we can, uh, we can build a, a Lego out of these two dimensional materials. And then finally, taking these structures, how we can build uh, energy generating or energy convergent systems. So what are uh, two dimensional materials? So 2D materials unlike uh, you know, bulk materials as you can see here, uh, you have length, breadth and height in any three dimensional materials like diamond or graphite or any sort of uh, three dimensional materials as we encounter every day. Two dimensional materials in contrast who it, it has length and breadth, but you will not able to find or you will not see its a height. It, it is compressed from G direction in such a way that uh, you, you look, it looks like a surface. So uh, it's a two dimensional material. As soon as we compress its uh, third dimension, then we're actually compressing the electron to be bound in a two dimensional world. So it's G uh, degree of freedom 
it's it's now uh, uh, it's now compressed and it is only confined to x and y direction so that leads to interesting physics and chemistry in these materials and therefore these are important and i am going to talk about various two dimensional materials out of uh, many different elements from the periodic table and how uh, we can uh, synthesize these materials and use it for different applications so here is a quiz uh, for the research scholars of course uh, what is the strongest material in the world uh, you know i'll answer it uh, it's graphene what is the thinnest material in the world is still graphene uh, which is the most conducting material it's also graphene and with the most flexible material it is also graphene so graphene which is one carbon atom thick material that i will discuss here it's a, a one atom thick carbon uh, allotrop with sp2 hybridizations and it's only 0.33 nanometer thick and it is the basic structural element for other graphitic materials for example you can take a piece of graphene and you cut it and it's try to stack one on another then you will be able to make a three dimensional graphite where you have a weak van der Waals force of attraction between the layers and you have a very strong uh, covalent bonding in the in the layer in, within the plane itself and if you take a, a piece of uh, graphene and cut it and then you try to roll it and depending on the roll how you are ro rolling it and or also depends on, uh, on, on what angle you are cutting, you can, you'll be able to form carbon nanotubes and the, if you can control the, uh, the cutting, then you will be able to form different forms of carbon nanotubes, for example, metallic to insulating or semiconducting. Similarly, you can also form carbon C60 or we call fullerene out of graphene therefore it is uh, called mother of all carbon allotropes of course these are all sp2 so i'll, I'll come to uh, discuss uh, what is sp2 hybridization in in, in uh, graphene and what for other sp3 hybridized materials like uh, diamond which has different uh, uh, different uh, uh, chemical bonding which is more of uh, silicon type uh, structure little more uh, into the structure of graphene as you can see this is one unit cell of graphene where the carbon atoms are separated with a 1.42 armstrong uh, this uh, two carbon atoms and if you look at the op these carbon atoms 2.4 armstrong and they are uh, at about 120 degree angle and if you if you take one uh, unit cell and try to build try to join different unit cells in x and y directions then you will form a graphene and uh, you you might expect that there will be six number of carbon atoms per unit cell actually if you count there will be only two number of carbon when they are connected into a large graphene structure so you have only two carbon atoms because uh, all these carbon atoms are shared between these unit cells so if you consider a, a carbon atom here, then it is shared with three unit cells. You have all, 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 the total of six carbon atoms. So you have, so you will have only two number of carbon atoms per unit cell for a when it is a graphene structure. So that leads to interesting, uh, interesting structure, interesting electronic band structure that we will uh, discuss soon. So more details uh, into uh, carbon. So uh, as we can know, carbon is the sixth element in the periodic table uh, with uh, four valence electrons. And if we, if, we, uh, if we write the electronic configuration, it's a 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, and 2p2, we can write 2px1 and 2py1. So you have 2pg, you could have 2pg. However, there is G electron, there is no electron, it is G0. And if you look at the, uh, look at the, this electronic configuration in a carbon atom, then your 1s is actually very close to the nucleus and you will do not, this electron, these two electrons in 1s orbital, they do not take part in the chemical bonding. Then you have 2s and 2p electrons, 
so they are far away from the nucleus so they will be they will be uh, contributing to the chemical bond formation with the nearest carbon atom then uh, you have uh, 2s with the two electrons can be uh, uh, can hybridize with the other p uh, orbitals so we, you can have uh, 2s1 then you have you can have 2px1 2py1 and 2pg1 as you can see here so so this s 1s and 2p that that constitute sp2 hybridization and then you have 2pg electron here so your sp2 hybridized structure sp2 hybridization that contributes to your in plane strength or covalent uh, bonding that is why graphene is so strong and, uh, and that contributes to the high mechanical strength which is about one terapascal for a graphene pristine graphene structure and then you have this p pg electron you call pi electron that is uh, that is for each carbon atom you have one pi electron and that contributes to the electronic electronic conductivity of our graphene so for each uh, carbon atom you have one electron but we remember that we discussed there are only two carbon atoms for unit cell, when you when you have the unit cell, then you will have only two carbon atoms, therefore only two electrons. So uh, so this constitute the electronic uh, cloud. So uh, because these electrons they do not uh, do not uh, uh, collide when when you apply an electric field and these electrons try to uh, transport because of the ap application of the electric field, then they do not encounter with the ion cores. They can simply, they can, they can, they can transport like a fluid. So uh, therefore you, will, you can expect very high conductivity and that is why graphene has very high uh, mobility, which is out of about 100,000 centimeters square per volt second, which is very high. Uh, if you if you compare with the silicon, which is about fourteen hundred centimeters square per volt second, which is really high for a material at one atom thick, just one atom thick. So you you, you can see here that this is this is the uh, this is the cartoon where you have the sp two hybridization that contributes to the 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 strength of for the graphene, and you have the pi electron that contributes to the to the uh, to the pi cloud and uh, and hence to the electrical conductivity and uh, then if we compare graphene with a semiconductor then uh, then if, uh, for a normal semiconductor we know that uh, we have uh, we you can you can use a schrodinger equation to describe uh, you can use schrodinger equation to describe the electronic electron motion in a semiconductor uh, and uh, the energy and momentum are described by E is P square over 2m, which is a parabolic equation. And therefore, you, you, you can expect uh, the band structure of, of this nature, uh, where you have field valence band and empty conduction band, and you have a band gap. However, in case of graphene, uh, so uh, the energy and momentum are linearly proportional because the electron can uh, move very fast uh, and it is massless. So the velocity of the electron is uh, it's very uh, almost uh, equivalent to velocity of light over 300 uh, divided by 300. Like if you consider uh, if uh, if you if you uh, we know that velocity of light is order of 10 to the power 8 meter per second uh, divided by 300, which is, this will be order of 10 to the 6 meter per second. Uh, the velocity of electron in graphene. And because energy is linear proportional, so as E equal to BF, and then you can expect a linear relationship between energy and momentum, and you do not have a gap here. Therefore, graphene is zero gap a semiconductor or, or, or uh, a metal. So uh, you have field uh, balance band because you have two electrons per unit cell that contributes the field, because you need two electrons to be filled, a band, then you have field valence band, you have empty conduction band. But however, here you need you here you have a in a normal semiconductor, you have you need to supply enough uh, energy for the electrons to to uh, to move uh, to jump from the valence band to conduction band. However, since the, the, you do not have a, 
uh, the, a finite gap, it's a zero gap, so it is easier for the electrons to transport from valency band to conduction band. And it is a zero band gap material, which is, uh, which is great for, for, high, uh, uh, for a high uh, conductivity applications. However, it's a problem when you will talk about uh, creating transistors out of uh, graphene because uh, you cannot switch off. As soon as you switch on, it always continues to switch on uh, and it will not be switched off because there is no band gap to make it off, so, unlike you are in case of a silicon. So uh, tremendous research is also uh, being focused on how to open the band gap in a material, in, in, in graphene. And therefore, because of this, these interesting properties, graphene got Nobel Prize uh, in 2010 uh, for uh, groundbreaking experiments. And the graphene uh, is in fact the first two-dimensional material. And after that, there are, there are thousands of two-dimensional materials are already discovered, and I am going to discuss some of them. And then uh, the topic uh, that I'll, I'll, I'll more focus on is the building the two-dimensional Lego is, is the recent topic that we can combine these two-dimensional materials to create a material which is which is who, which property is completely different from the individual uh, materials. So next, uh, let's talk about 2D materials beyond graphene. So here, graphene uh, was the beginning, uh, and then uh, there are materials like hexagonal boronitride, uh, which is an insulator, which is an atomically thin insulator where, in, uh, where you have boron and nitrogen atoms can be replaced by carbon. Uh, carbon atoms can be replaced by boron and nitrogen atoms if you consider graphene analogous then you will you will you will uh, create a structure where you have boron and nitrogen are alternatively placed in a hexagonal ring and that is hexagonal boronite uh, boronitride uh, so just like you have a uh, you know uh, in case of graphene you have graphite diamond and different uh, forms of uh, alert, carbon allotope similarly for boronitride you can have a cubic forms of boronitride you have hexagonal forms of boronitride you have also turbostratic boronitride, amorphous boronitride. However, the hexagonal form of boronitride is actually two-dimensional. It is a layered structure. Other forms of boronitride is not, just like diamond in case of carbon, it's not a two-dimensional material. It's not at, at all SP2 hybrid, it's a SP3 hybridization. Similarly, uh, with this, this is insulating, as you can see here, uh, this is for boronitride, the order of six electron volt band gap between uh, conduction band, the uh, bottom of the conduction band and the top of the valency band. And then we also need some materials. There are some materials uh, whose band gap is between uh, zero band gap material graphene, which is here, and uh, the uh, insulating uh, material boronitide. So these are transition metal dichalcogenides. Uh, uh, and those, these are uh, two-dimensional uh, semiconductors and their band gap varies from one to three electron volts and uh, they are just like a normal semiconductor for example silicon they behave uh, like uh, like uh, semiconductors however they are atomically thin uh, because it is a three three element you can see molybdenum and the two sulfurs so you have a molybdenum or tungsten that is sandwiched between sulfur on top and on the bottom so it's a, actually it's a three atom thick material. However, the thickness is only about 0.7 nanometer, whereas the graphene or boronitide thickness is about only 0.34 nanometer. So if we look at the uh, the energy uh, the energy band or energy spectrum, then graphene because it has zero band gap, it can cover the uh, almost a broad spectrum of energy starting from visible. Uh, uh, light to infrared to microwaves or radio waves because it, a, it has a zero band gap material. Then you have boronitride, it is six electron volt that corresponds to UV part of the spectrum because ultraviolet light has a high energy. Uh, and then these are semiconductor transition metal dichalcogenides like molybdenum disulfide or tungsten disulfide. They correspond to the visible part of the spectrum because their band gap varies from one to three electron volts. There are other materials like phosphorine or black phosphorus, 
So whose band gap is 0.3 to 2 electron volt that also corresponds to visible to part to some part of the infrared light. So now we can also think about how we can use individual uh, these materials individually because one one is only let's say if you we'll talk about boronited it's only active in the uv light it can be useful for the uv uh, detector or uv part of the light it can combine with the transition method i calcogenides which is response response to the visible part of the light so that way so we can we can do a lot of permutation or combinations we can uh, combine these materials to create the desired structures or devices. So next question is how to synthesize these uh, materials. These are atomically thin materials uh, and uh, what are the ways to, to synthesize? So like any uh, nanotechnology research uh, uh, where we have two different approaches, one is top-down approach, another one is bottom approach, bottom up approach. So similarly, we'll follow those two approach, approaches for the, uh, for the synthesis of these atomically thin materials. Like in the top down approach, we have uh, physical exfoliation or chemical exfoliation. It's simply like you take a piece of uh, graphite and graphite, uh, as, as in the beginning uh, we discussed the graphite uh, where it's a layered material and uh, graphite consists of many layers of graphene when we write uh, uh, in our school, when, you, uh, when we write uh, using a pencil, we produce a lot of graphene layers. Uh, by unknowingly, we are, we were actually producing a lot of graphene layers because we're rubbing the graphite on, on, on a paper. So because, the, because in a graphite, you have a weak Van der Waals bond, bond between the layers. So if you use a scotch tape, then you will be able to uh, peel some of the graphene. Uh, uh, of course, there are few layers of graphene, then you can transfer, you can do multiple transfer on a silicon oxide substrate, uh, then you will be able to finally, you will be able to get uh, some one atom thick uh, graphene layers. So this is a simple approach of uh, producing graphene from graphite. And this is the approach where uh, the Nobel laureates that I, 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 I showed you, they were the first to exfoliate graphene from graphite uh, in 2004. And uh, they were able to measure the electrical conductivity in the graphene and that led to the Nobel Prize. Then, uh, however, this, the graphene that produced on silicon oxide is very small. So though it is very up, it is it is of good quality. It's the highest quality, in fact. However, the size is very small. It may not be applicable for for uh, any large scale applications that uh, that a, that an industry might need. So therefore, we have chemical exfoliation where we can take graphite. We can use strong oxidizing agents like sulfur acid or poor KMnO4. Uh, and then uh, we can we can uh, we can oxidize. We can do a, an experiment, a chemical experiment called uh, oxidation, where uh, the oxidizing agents can introduce into the layers uh, in a graphite, and uh, so that uh, the Van der Waals bond becomes even weaker. And then we can use a sonicator to sonicate these uh, uh, weakly bonded uh, graphite to exfoliate the layers in a solution process. process. So where we will be able to form graphene, however, it's, 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 it's called chemically derived graphene because it still has some oxidizing agents attached to the graphene uh, edges or on the basal surfaces. Uh, you will be not be able to get rid of all the functional groups that is being attached during the oxidation process. Therefore, we still it call we still call graphene oxide or reduced graphene oxide. We uh, it's difficult to get a pristine graphene out of this process. However, we'll be able to produce uh, graphene in the large quantity. Then the other uh, approach is uh, bottom up approach, where we can start with uh, individual carbon atoms and can produce a layer of graphene. Where we started with a, a 3D graphite. Uh, in a top-down approach, here we can start with a single carbon atom and can build the graphene. So there are two ways. Uh, uh, one is epitaxial growth on silicon carbide and then uh, chemical vapor deposition. In case of epitaxial growth on silicon carbide, you know, you, in, in case of silicon carbide insulating substrate, you, if you heat it, 
then uh, what we'll try to do, we'll try to boil a uh, boil silicon carbide where the silicon atoms uh, evaporate and then you will be uh, you will have only carbon atoms on top and that can hybridize itself uh, to form the layers of graphene it's a very uh, uh, time as well as energy consuming process because in silicon carbide in order to in order to evaporate silicon you need to heat it at a very high temperature of order of 1400 degrees celsius as well as you need very high vacuum so it, it's a very expensive process. However, you'll be able to get a high quality graphene. And then another process that uh, what I do uh, research and uh, uh, it's called chemical vapor deposition where you can use methane or any sort of carbon uh, hydrocarbon sources in the gaseous form or in the liquid form. And uh, you will be able to uh, dissociate hydrogen out of methane, for example, here. And then these carbon radicals uh, they can uh, uh, they can hybridize themselves uh, to form a layer of graphene. I will discuss more uh, on the production of graphene using chemical vapor deposition. Two D material graphene, as I discussed here, uh, where you have methane gases that flows into the chamber, and uh, the heat there is the chamber is being heated. Uh, at a certain temperature, depending on the uh, the temperature we set, uh, so that it, the methane can dissociate, uh, and uh, there is a catalyst because we need a catalyst. For example, copper, nickel, or cobalt, or iron, especially the transition metals, uh, because that that will lower the uh, temperature for the methane dissociation. Otherwise, we might need a very high temperature. So, for example, we use uh, copper or nickel uh, to dissociate methane, and then the carbon radicals uh, can uh, form, uh, can hybridize among themselves, or can connect to themselves to form uh, graphene. In case of uh, a nickel, you can see here, so what happens, the nickel has a high carbon solubility with uh, high carbon solubility at higher temperature, the permethane, the carbon can diffuse into the nickel while uh, the growth is happening. And then as the cooling starts, so then carbon atoms diffuse out from the nickel and form graphene. So the amount of carbon that uh, is being diffused into the nickel that should come out uh, or because we need to control the cooling process. It, cooling has to be fast so that the carbon atoms can come out. However, there is a possibility of uh, producing multiple layers of graphene. In case of copper, so uh, the copper uh, copper has low carbon solubility and uh, carbon atoms only confined to the surface uh, because copper, copper doesn't uh, form a copper carbide. So the process or the mechanism in surface reaction and uh, uh, it is uh, it is therefore copper is preferred uh, for a single layer uh, graphene formation. However, in both these cases, either copper, nickel, or any other metals, the material or the two D material that is being formed, for example, graphene is uh, formed on copper. It needs to be transferred onto a silicon oxide substrate because we will not be able to. Uh, measure the Raman or will not be able to measure the electrical conductivity when this 2D material graphene, let's say here graphene is sitting on a copper. So in order to do that, we, what we what we do, we put or we uh, coat a layer of polymer, for example, here polymer PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, we coat on graphene, then we etch the copper using copper agents like uh, copper sulfate or iron sulfate and then uh, this polymer which is a which is a uh, sacrificial layer that is holding graphene uh, and then we need to transfer this st structure onto a silicon oxide substrate and then uh, we can remove this polymer using another organic solvent for example acetone and then finally we'll have graphene sitting on a silicon oxide substrate which can be which can be used to measure the electrical conductivity or raman uh, spectroscopy 
uh, measurements as well as other uh, device applications that can be that can only possible if graphene can uh, can be placed on silicon oxide or any insulating softwares so therefore it's a complex process to transfer so what i'm going to present now how i was able to get rid of uh, this uh, transfer related process uh, and uh, uh, started thinking about some of the process that can lead to formation of graphene directly on these insulating or dielectric softwares uh, so one such example is producing interlay graphene on silicon oxide so uh, what we have done so silicon so we have silicon substrate and we used a layer of uh, copper however the copper is highly polycrystalline and uh, so that means it has a lot of grain boundaries so not only the grain boundaries you can see from top but also some of the grain boundary that is connecting from top to bottom so and then we introduced we, we did exactly same process as uh, i showed earlier used methane gas to decompose into carbon and hydrogen and then carbon radicals now diffuse into these grain boundaries and started nucleating uh, on silicon oxide software directly uh, and uh, now you are forming a layer of graphene between copper and silicon dioxide and then what we can do next step is to remove this copper layer where your graphene is directly sitting on silicon dioxide and here here are ramon uh, uh, spectra that shows the graphene formation of graphene because if you see a g band at about 1560 and a 2d band uh, which is a uh, overtone of this defect induced to d band then uh, you will you will you can see that is a this is a graphitic structure however if you have the 2d band is intensity is higher than the g band like it, if it is double then you can you can uh, confirm that it is a single layer of graphene so from the raman uh, spectra we will be able to confirm the uh, graphene as well as the number of layers and uh, in addition to other other uh, uh, physical uh, parameters of graphene and here is a mapping of the graphene uh, that is formed on directly on the silicon oxide that it shows have a continuous graphene graphene structure on the substrate and to further optimize the process you can control the number of grain boundaries uh, by uh, annealing uh, these substrates and you can see here that graphene in the beginning when you have less grain boundaries they started forming as a as a nucleation points and then you have uh, small small islands with uh, optimum grain boundary with with a little uh, larger grain boundary if you have a if you have a uh, if you have a decent amount uh, decent number of grain boundaries uh, then we have a continuous uh, continuous graph information on directly on silicon oxide substrate and, uh, and then it is equally important to understand uh, the electronic transport of these uh, structures so you have graphene now this is direct graphene uh, on silicon oxide substrate and we put uh, metal uh, as a source and drain and uh, we have measured the electronic uh, conductivity which is about uh, 270 centimeter square per volt second for the graphene which is uh, sitting uh, on directly on silicon oxide without any any transfer related steps as you can see here this is the graphene small graphene structure and we have metal as a source uh, another metal as a drain and then we applied electric uh, field here we have applied potential we measured the current and uh, from there from the current and uh, potential we are able to measure the uh, electronic mobility at very low temperature 10 kelvin then uh, as I, uh, in the beginning I discussed graphene is not the only material uh, that we study there are materials beyond graphene and here is another material called hexagonal boron nitride i introduced in the beginning which where you have boron and nitrogen atoms uh, can be replaced uh, uh, carbon atoms can be replaced by boron and nitrogen atoms they are alternative to each other boron nitrogen boron nitrogen uh, and they are isostructural uh, to graphene and also isoelectronic uh, however, uh, boron nitride is, uh, is, is an insulator with six electron volt uh, energy band gap. 
So I followed a very similar process where uh, instead of, uh, because we have boron and nitrogen uh, are the uh, elements, are the atoms in the boron nitrogen structure. So I used boron ammonia as a precursor, which is a solid precursor, which is BS3 and S3. Uh, and that break down to boragine, which is a graphene a benzene kind of structure. And then also there is a polymeric uh, of, uh, amino boron. So these are the constituents uh, that uh, this ammonia boron breaks down at a higher uh, at a, a temperature about 100 degrees Celsius, which is a separate chamber. Uh, that here I I, uh, I can show you. Here is a separate chamber where I place the precursor and I heat it uh, 80 to 100 degrees Celsius, and then I uh, introduce I open this valve, and this gas comes into the main chamber, and we have directly silicon oxide substrate. Uh, which is sitting here in the high furnace, high temperature furnace, which is about uh, 1100 degrees Celsius. And this uh, precursor gas comes in, and then uh, your uh, boronited formation uh, happens um, directly on silicon based substrates. And again, uh, Raman uh, spectra is the, it's called fingerprint for all uh, 2D materials research that uh, we took advantage of. Uh, the Raman uh, spectroscopy to understand the boronitride structure, which is which only uh, uh, for boronitride it, it it is only one Raman peak at about 1365 centimeter inverse, as you can see here. As the temperature goes up in the the growth temperature, the the uh, intensity of this uh, uh, of the boronitride peak also becomes higher. That corresponds to thicker boronitide layer because with higher temperature the growth rate uh, becomes also higher therefore you have more number of layers uh, on silicon oxide substrates and uh, these are uh, some of the correct optical and uh, spectroscopic characterization of uh, hexagonal boronitide which is a two-dimensional form of boronitride directly on silicon oxide and uh, i can show one uh, interesting interesting characterization here you can see your silicon oxide this is a this is an atomic force microscopic uh, image where you have silicon oxide, uh, which is a silicon oxidized silicon. It can see here, it's still uh, rough at the atomic scale. Then you have boronitride coated silicon oxide. It's a two dimensional boronitride. Uh, you can see how smooth it is, six, order, order of six uh, times uh, smoother uh, compared to the silicon oxide. And therefore boronitride is a suitable uh, soft rate uh, for electronics uh, and uh, in fact in, in electronics in, in in integrated circuits where boronitide can be used can replace silicon oxide uh, because it is atomically thin and and and, and smooth uh, therefore you will uh, you can and also at the same time it's a high thermal conductivity so which will also be useful for thermal management it's a, it's an important material that is being studied uh, for for electronics and uh, again, once boronitide is formed, it is important to understand the quality. So we placed a, a layer of graphene on top of boronitride, and uh, we measured the electrical conductivity of the graphene on boronitride, and uh, uh, we are able to find uh, the electric the charge carrier mobility of about uh, 1,200 centimeters square per volt second when the graphene is sitting on a boronitride structure then uh, graphene is sitting on a silicon oxide or silicon nitride substrate so which is remarkable that if you take a graphene this is this is how the formation of a two-dimensional lego putting one two-dimensional material on another material and now because boronitide is atomically smooth and it is uh, less defects compared to silicon oxide uh, and uh, uh, therefore you can see about uh, uh, almost uh, three orders of uh, three times higher uh, charge carrier mobility for, for a graphene sitting on a boronitride in comparison to graphene sitting on a silicon nitride or silicon dioxide. So with uh, the formation of these uh, two dimensional materials like graphene and boronitride, now let's look at how we can build heterostructures out of these 2D materials. Uh, that is because uh, if you take a graphene and it, it, is, it is chemically inert, However, it's very sensitive because you can you can think like it as a, a paper, and if you put uh, 
or, or, or a very thin uh, layer, if you put on any soft red, it will try to conform to that soft red. So, and uh, any, 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 um, anything from top of graphene or from the bottom can influence its energy band gap, can influence its uh, electronic conductivity or also its mechanical uh, properties. So uh, it is important to sandwich the structure. It is important to, uh, to create some heterostructures to protect graphene from external uh, influence. For example, any, any oxygen atoms or hydrogen atom that can come and sit on graphene, uh, it will influence, it will drastically influence its uh, uh, electrical conductivity can get, electrical conductivity can get reduced uh, uh, many orders of magnitude if you have a single defect uh, on, on top of graphene. So how to uh, create heterostructures and what materials will be the uh, will be suitable for for uh, graphene? Uh, that is that what I am going to discuss now. Here there are different ways you can create heterostructure. For example, if you are taking a graphite and uh, and a piece of boronitride bulk, then you can ex you, you can you can exfoliate using a scotch tape that I discussed in the beginning. You can use a scotch tape, take a layer of graphene, put on a silicon ox oxide and take a layer of boronitride and put on top of it. So you can also create heterostructure using just using simple scotch tape process. Also, you can grow a layer of boronitride fast on a, on a, on a metal film or on a, directly on a silicon oxide or, or a dielectric soft red. And then you can uh, scotch tape uh, graphene and put it on the, on the boronitride that is already prepared on a, a dielectric soft red. So, uh, uh, or we can create directly both graphene or boronitride using a CBT process where we can completely avoid all the transfer related steps. So, uh, so uh, uh, it, it, is, it is something like we are using, uh, you know, Lego, uh, Lego blocks that I have created here. We are using simple uh, Lego that you can individual materials, uh, you can consider individual uh, uh, layers. So these are, these are individual materials and then you're putting on top of another, okay? So just like you can have graphene, uh, it's one kind of uh, Lego, then boronite MOS2, molybdenum disulfide, these are transition metal dicalcogenides or, or fluorinated graphene is also another graphene-like graphene, graphene material. Uh, and you can take all of them and putting one on another. It's building a leg. It's just like, you know, preparing your sandwich for your breakfast, that's one here. So uh, why, uh, why, uh, why these uh, Lego structures or heterostructures are important? Uh, there are recent uh, you know, uh, studies that if you take these uh, structures uh, and then you rotate them uh, and we call it a uh, magic angle, it's just at an angle of 1.1 degree, just like you hear, 1.08 degree precisely. So you will be able to see uh, a drastic uh, uh, transition um, to a state called superconductivity. So you will be able to see superconductivity in graphene. Uh, just if you put graphene, one graphene layer on another and rotate it at a 1.1 degree. 1.08 degree. So this is uh, this is one of the example of uh, building uh, Lego blocks of 2D materials or building uh, heterostructures. And then also if you if you build uh, MOS to like transition metal dicalcogenides, if you put uh, the two transition metal dicalcogenides on top of each other, then what uh, you will observe is called interlayer exciton. So we have excitons is a uh, it's electron and hole bound electron hole pair and in most of the time we we have studied that uh, these materials uh, it can be in uh, individual uh, these uh, interlayer these excitons can be in individual materials however if you can stack these materials and uh, then you will be able to see interlayer excitons that means electrons from one material and hole from another material they can form uh, the exciton. 
So that's called interlayer excitant. So uh, not only that, interlayer magnetism, strong mid IR photoresponse, topological polaritons, and the photonic magic angle. So these are all new uh, physics, uh, physical phenomena uh, has emerged in the heterostructures. So therefore, these this is uh, uh, this study is, uh, is is important and recent, and I'm going to show some of from my research how we are building these kind of structures without using any transfer that I discussed earlier, uh, and uh, we are also able to rotate uh, uh, to rotate these structures. So uh, traditionally, uh, these materials are placed. Uh, one on uh, one on another, as you can see here, uh, this is a polymer-based transfer where you can put graphene or boronitate on, uh, on a silicon oxide softer first, and then take graphene and put it on boronitride, and then use a AFM tip, AFM tip to rotate uh, these materials to get the angles. As you can see here. So, however, again, uh, we are using same transfer-related steps as well as a, a rotation, a, 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 uh, the approach, which is time consuming, as well as, uh, as also it will be uh, also difficult to, to precisely control the angle. Uh, so uh, here uh, is one study is from our research where we can create a synthesis of, or we can create 2D band roll set of structures without using any transport related steps. So what we can do is can start with the silicon oxide software that we have done and then uh, grown uh, hexagonal boronitride first and that I showed uh, how hexagonal boronitride can be grown on silicon oxide substrate at a high temperature using ammonia boron as the precursor. And then uh, we use a layer of polycrystalline copper uh, and uh, introduced carbon uh, uh, based, uh, uh, hydrocarbon based uh, sources, gaseous sources to produce graphene at the, uh, at the interface of boronitride and copper, then we can remove the copper, then we will be able to get graphene on boronitride heterostructure. And uh, uh, these are the uh, Raman as well as uh, opt optical characterizations uh, of uh, the heterostructure graphene on boronitride. Here you can see uh, the D, G, and 2D Raman bands that corresponds to graphene. And for boronitride, the Raman band is at, at about 1365, which is very close to the Raman band for graphene's D band, which is the defect induced band in graphene. So uh, therefore you can see here a soldier that corresponds to boronitride. So that means boronitride and graphene both are formed here. That continues from this uh, mapping uh, from the D, G and 2D band Raman mapping of the, of, the, of the structure. So these are continuously formed. And most importantly, these uh, structures are, are rotated in situ. And here's a movie uh, that that should show, so drawn. So if we start rotating uh, these structures, uh, then uh, you will be able to get at different angles. You will have different peaks. And for us, it is 16 degree. Uh, at 16 degree, we found that the graphene uh, is rotated on boronitride and with a pH of uh, with a pH of about uh, 0.89 nanometer. So uh, these are all automatically and in situ grown heterostructures without using any transfer as well as without using any rotation uh, tools. And uh, we also uh, uh, did, uh, since these structures are interesting and directly formed. And uh, we were able to measure the electrical conductivity and, uh, and found about 100 centimeters square per volt second electrical mobility, which is uh, two orders of magnitude higher uh, in comparison to the directly grown heterostructures that have done so far, which showed about only one centimeter square per volt second. Great. So, uh, ma'am, uh, may I know how, uh, like, uh, how long I have? How many minutes? 
Five more minutes you can take, sir. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vera. So uh, next, uh, next is uh, to show how these uh, structures, how these heterostructures, can be useful for creating uh, energy conversion devices. That is, uh, that also I'm primarily focusing. So uh, looking at the uh, energy scenario here, I'm putting the Indian uh, in India's uh, uh, renewable energy source, particularly solar energy. Uh, we still have only 8.4% uh, of energy is coming from solar. And uh, if you can look at the solar map, then we have plenty of sunlight uh, throughout the country. So therefore it is important uh, to understand or to produce high efficiency photovoltaic devices and high efficiency as well as low cost. If we look at the, uh, the energy, uh, the source of energy, that the amount of energy that we can produce in one hour is is equivalent to the amount of energy that we uh, produce. The, the amount of energy that is produced from sun is equivalent to um, the amount of energy that is produced in one year from uh, a solar therm or thermal plant or hydro plant or from the oil or petroleum. So we have plenty of uh, plenty of energy if we can uh, efficiently produce from sunlight, and uh, and this is how a, a solar cell work. You have photons coming from sunlight, and you have semiconductors P type or N type. This is a, this is a conventional uh, silicon solar cell, and that produced electrons and holes. And then uh, because of the inbuilt electric field, your electrons and holes can be transported. Uh, to the opposite electrodes and then the flow of electrons and then you'll be able to get a voltage and current out of this device. And then how 2D materials, uh, these atomically thin materials can be useful for photovoltaics has been our uh, interest uh, and uh, we have done uh, a, a little amount of work and a lot of uh, work is still going on and uh, it to be done and here are some of the examples where we, 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 we replaced one graph one silicon for example in a silicon solar cell you have a p type and n type and you can replace actually n type either n type or p type you can use just use a 2d material in, in, for example in this case is graphene uh, and then uh, you will have only a 2d 3d kind of junction and uh, here your electric your the built-in potential or the junction actually comes near to the surface, near here, near to the, very close to the surface. And uh, because the junction is close to the surface, therefore the electric field can help the charge carriers to, um, to, to travel faster uh, because unlike in a silicon solar cell where your junction is buried inside here, and then uh, your electron has to all the way uh, from, the, from here to the, to the electrodes, so there is probability that the electrons can recombine and can loss. So by using this uh, kind of technique, uh, the 2D, 3D kind of junction, you will, can eliminate uh, the, num the, the recombinations. So inspired by that theory, uh, uh, we built uh, graphene silicon uh, junctions and we also put uh, several metal, uh, metal atoms on top to further, uh, further uh, enhance the light uh, absorption and we're able to uh, enhance the current uh, here in a in a graphene silicon uh, type of junction. So these junctions, these devices are not only uh, useful for uh, solar cell, can be useful for many other optoelectronic uh, devices uh, that is that is currently living uh, studied. And here is the process how you can use uh, metals on uh, top of graphene because graphene you can you can you can um, uh, think of as a chemically not structure if it is pristine, therefore it will be difficult to put a metal on uh, on on, a, on any hexagonal uh, ring. Uh, however, you can, uh, we can functionalize without uh, without creating any defects in the structure, and then uh, then we can anchor these metals in order to uh, enhance the current, the, enhance the current by absorbing more light from sun. 
and this is how you can uh, encode the silver nanoparticles on top of graphene. You can see your functionalized graphene anchoring silver nanoparticles, your own functionalized graphene anchoring silver nanoparticles. It is difficult to anchor or difficult to decorate graphene with the nanoparticles on top without any functionalization. And then another type of structure where we have a two-dimensional semiconductor, which is tungsten disulfide, and placed on a graphene. And uh, both these structures, both these heterostructures, are placed on silicon. And this uh, combined hybrid structure was synthesized again using a CBD process that I discussed. Uh, and then uh, it was also able to uh, here we are able to measure uh, higher uh, current because of the tungsten disulfide on top because it is a it is a high absorbing uh, absorption it has high absorption coefficient uh, compared to silicon as well as uh, graphene and the another type of structure which is uh, which is different than the planar structures that i discussed here is a structure where we have a, a nanoware uh, for example here zinc oxide nanoware and we can we can wrap or we can clad a layer of graphene on top uh, and instead of creating a uh, planar junctions, we are creating radial junctions. So here photons uh, can be confined uh, as, well as, uh, as, well as, the, uh, as well as we can build uh, many such structures. So in case of a planar junction, you can create, there can be one junction, but in case of a radial junction, you can create several such ensemble of, or ensemble of such uh, structures that, uh, that can lead to uh, higher, higher photovoltaic performance. And because we are, we can we can wrap graphene. Therefore, the symmetry is broken. And because the symmetry is broken, now we can open the band gap that we discussed in the beginning. That graphene is a zero band gap material, and this is the process where we can open the band gap as well. And that is that is good for light absorption because you have a band gap. It can absorb, uh, uh, absorb. Uh, it, it 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 will be able to. Uh, it can it it will be able to act as a photoactive material. And this is how we can grow these nanowares, zinc oxide nanowares, and then using a CBD process, we can coat these nanowares with graphene. And then, and then this is a SEM image of the coat graphene coated uh, zinc oxide nanostructures. And uh, and we have also uh, uh, built the device and measured the high photovoltage and uh, high uh, and and a consistent current uh, uh, in these devices. As you can see here the current is constant over a long wavelength range uh, and you can see here that uh, the if if the current will be dropped uh, dropped uh, here uh, or at any any point then you can see that the 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 this uh, light absorption or the charge transport uh, is happening with the zinc oxide but it is not the cons the current is constant over a long wavelength range that corresponds uh, to the fact that graphene is the material that is contributing to the uh, to the photocurrent. And with this, I'll uh, uh, thank you, uh, all the participants, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it was really a wonderful and excellent work and a presentation by you. We are really uh, glad to have you today morning and uh, really we are thank thankful to you. You have spent your time though it is night for you but uh, without sleeping you have given a very nice presentation after having dinner. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you sir. So there are uh, questions from uh, participants. The first question is why does the relative rotation why does the relative rotation of the layers increase the conduction of the bulk is it audible yes yes perfect yes, yes. so if I, if I can understand the question so why the uh, relative rotation uh, of the individual layers increase the conductivity yes yes absolutely so yeah that's a, this is a great question and uh, uh, actually what happens uh, uh, so uh, when when we place uh, individual layers, for example, uh, this this is if we talk about uh, only graphene and graphene, another graphene. Let's say it's called uh, bilayer graphene. When we sandwich, when we uh, when we place one graphene on top of another, it's a bilayer graphene structure. And when they are not rotated, 
then uh, uh, and uh, they are not rotated then they still uh, uh, possess like their uh, individual materials okay and as soon as they are rotated at a let's say at just 1.1 degree then uh, the potentials so that they have they have the potentials uh, that undergoes hybridization so the hybridization further hybridization happening between these two layers and they are now started acting as a one material and that is called a twisted bilayer heterostructure and as soon as that happened uh, and now, now these two potentials of these two layers they couple with each other which is called a coupled structure and that leads to the superconductivity and which we call flat band superconductivity in the bilayer heterostructure yeah yeah thank you sir uh, one more uh, one more question why is called black phosphorus oh okay great so thank you again uh, for this question so uh, actually phosphor just like we have uh, let's say we have a uh, carbon allotropes like we have graphite uh, we have uh, fullerene graphene carbon nanotubes uh, amorphous carbon similarly for phosphorus we have black phosphorus or red phosphorus or, or different uh, so the, these are just the name and uh, and and uh, and the black phosphorus is actually a two dimensional so so we we do have other phosphorus structures uh, red phosphorus but, but but these are not two dimensional so black phosphorus is just like if black phosphorus is similar to your graphite so black phosphorus where you can uh, it is just like graphite for carbon where you can have uh, you, you can take out the individual phosphorus uh, individual one layer of phosphorus then it is called phosphorine so just like you have graphene it's called phosphorine it's a one layer of black phosphorus wow uh, yes sir thank you sir uh, can this heterostructures be reliable material for electronic uh, solid state devices absolutely this is again another fantastic question uh, and uh, in fact uh, heterostructures uh, yeah, are, are 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 reliable and and uh, and most of the research is being focused on creating or designing new chemistries or new routes or new ways to to uh, to uh, create these heterostructures so because uh, individual graphene it may not be stable or uh, it it may not show high conductivity when graphene we can we can place graphene on a layer of boron nitride uh, and and place another boron nitride on top for example we can sandwich a layer of graphene between two boron nitrides then it can it, it uh, then you can expect really high electrical conductivity in this uh, in structure so heterostructures are most reliable for electronics or solid state devices uh, and and uh, and uh, we have already started uh, doing that very nice yeah uh, one more question sir if we use graphene on the surface of solar cell what will be its uh, optical transmission so uh, graphene uh, you know uh, as we discussed uh, the the physics of graphene from the beginning and that it is uh, it, it has uh, about uh, if you if you can create a single layer of graphene and uh, it has no defect let's say defect free graphene then you will have 97% uh, transmittance so in a solar cell is a complex device as it, lo it looks like very simple but uh, you can think of using graphene uh, for what uh, what applications for example, you can use graphene on top as a transparent uh, and current spreading electrode layer where you can use it so that so that graphene so that light can pass through because it is just like glass right a glass is 100 percent transparent uh, transmitter has 100 percent transmittance graphene is 97.7 percent transmittance at the yeah. same time graphene can also conduct whereas your glass cannot conduct glass is an electrically insulator however it is optically transparent graphene is both electrically conducting as well as optically conducting as well or optically transparent so we have to think of how to use it uh, in different parts so graphene is being used many different parts of solar cell not only 
on the only on top surface oh very nice so is graphene thermal conductor yes yes uh, graphene is also a thermal conductor uh, in fact uh, yeah it's a very good uh, thermal conductor yeah. as well yes yeah very nice uh, sir okay sir at what temperature graphene behaves as a super uh, conductor so uh, graphene uh, um, graphene uh, it's not just a graphene uh, as, as i discussed the twisted uh, twisted bilayer heterostructure of graphene so uh, twisted bilayer heterostructure of graphene which is twisted which is uh, the structure is twisted at about 1.1 uh, 1 degree uh, and uh, it's it's still uh, uh, it's not uh, room temperature yet uh, uh but uh, i think i need to check uh, the temperature it is still it's not a room temperature superconductivity it is oh. still low temperature but uh, uh, i need to check the uh, the temperature ah sure sir okay sir so uh, uh, there are two more questions how zinc oxide wires enhance the photo absorption so uh zinc oxide uh, you know uh, if you if you consider uh, something is uh, is uh, placed uh, as a uh, planar junction versus if if you have a uh, wire like structure wire so we have created zinc oxide uh, semiconductor as a nano wires and uh, then we clad a uh, graphene on top okay so we are creating a core cell kind of structure so and we are making we we are creating many such uh, structures in a 1 cm 1 cm uh, device so uh, so therefore since we have many such nanowares so zinc oxide uh, nanowares semiconductor nanowire uh, can have enhanced light absorption because of the phonon uh, confinement so you have nano structures so phonon can be easily confined and get absorbed uh, uh, get absorbed but but uh, since your solar if you look at the solar spectrum then you have very less uh, light in the video in the uv rays because zinc oxide cannot absorb the spectrum solar spectrum in the most of the solar spectrum uh, because they are in the visible range so so it can only absorb uv so uh, so, so uh, therefore if the uv part of the light can be absorbed and most of the absorption is happening actually happening in graphene so once the light is absorbed in graphene and then uh, graphene and uh, zinc oxide junction the radial junction that leads to the do uh, the photon uh, uh, dissociates into uh, electrons and holes and then uh, the transport is happening through the wire actually it is not uh, helping the zinc oxide is not helping in absorption a lot graphene is helping in the light absorption but zinc oxide is uh, taking care of the uh, transport Uh, transport of uh, carriers after the photon uh, uh, creates electrons and holes okay thank you sir the last question uh, we have does zero gap in graphene mean that any temperature the electrons are in dynamical equilibrium just you have answer let few the valence band and conduction band sir like that uh, one participants from uh, yeah this question from one of the participants does zero gap in graphene mean that any temperature at any temperature the electrons are in dynamical equilibrium between the valence and conduction band this is a great question so i'm trying to go back to uh, that slide uh, so uh, uh, for example if you if you look at the electronic uh, band structure Uh, for graphene here uh, in the structure uh, here in this figure so uh, the question is uh, if uh, at the at the if the electrons so so most of the time so your uh, your valence band for a graphene uh, for a pristine graphene here your valence band is filled and because you have two electrons uh, for unit cell that we that we discussed from the unit cell structure of graphene and then your conduction band is empty so electrons since you have zero band gap electrons can easily you know, uh, can, can can move from valence band to conduction band if you apply uh, either some temperature or if there is any change in temperature so so 
uh, if if electrons uh, electron can uh, can jump from valence band to conduction band then we will be able to create uh, some kind of excitons so uh, and however uh, since it's a zero band gap it's more likely that the electron can again uh, come back because you do not have a, uh, a band gap so um, at different uh, temperatures uh, at different temperature uh, uh, so the electrons depending on the energy the thermal energy for example at room temperature which is uh, about uh, uh, 25 uh, 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 milli, milli electron volts of energy at 300 kelvin uh, so uh, this uh, transition is possible and at different temperatures electrons undergo different uh, transition levels so uh, it is it is uh, uh, thermodynamical equilibrium but the dynamically it is not not in equilibrium Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, is there multiple absorption happening in a radial cell of graphene? Uh, in case of a radial uh, structure, radial uh, core cell architecture uh, for graphene on a wide band gap semiconductor, uh, there is uh, multiple absorptions, uh, yes, of course, happening. Uh, uh, so as I said, the solar spectrum is very broad. Uh, it most of the solar spectrum is uh, visible light. That means uh, a semiconductor which, uh, which band gap falls under the visible light spectrum that can absorb, that can only absorb those light. Uh, and then the, you do have a small UV light in the solar spectrum. And that is also can be absorbed in the wide band gap semiconductor. So that is the purpose why we choose wide band gap uh, semiconductor. So so that uh, that that is also can be absorbed. So there are a multiple absorption uh, happening in, uh, in 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 the core as well as cell. But okay. most of the absorption happening in the cell. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, really, it was a wonderful presentation by you. And uh, I hope all the questions, uh, the answers are cleared by the participants. So finally, we have come to the end of the webinar. Okay, so I take this opportunity to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of Indian Academy Degree College Autonomous Bangalore. At the outset, I thank the management of Indian Academy Degree College uh, group of institutions for their support rendered to us in organizing this international webinar. First of all, my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Sanjay Bevra, Assistant Professor, uh, the Assistant Professor, University of Arkansas, USA, and the resource person of the day. So thank you, sir, for your stimulating talk on 2D Lego. So your session was very informative, well explained and elaborative. It was really excellent work what you have done. And uh, so really you have put more uh, hard work on this uh, to do all this Lego thing kind of things. And we have cleared more on graphene uh, uh, from the fundamentals to the synthesis and then development of the model. Uh, so very nice, sir. We really grateful for the time and the effort you took to share your presentation and your thoughts and experience in the field of 2D, two-dimensional materials. And uh, particularly the graphene and boron nitride, uh, boron nitride, all the things. Uh, and we have really cleared all our things on this uh, nanotechnology field also. So now I would like to thank Dr. Sriniti K. Parthasarathi, Chief Operating Officer, Indian Academy Group of Institutions for his moral support. My sincere thanks to our beloved principal, Dr. E. Zaram Xavier, Indian Academy Degree College Autonomous for his continuous support and valuable guidance. I thank all the faculty members of the Department of Physics for their help and cooperation.
my special thanks to all the participants for gathering their knowledge in the field uh, of uh, 2d materials particularly for graphing uh, okay and i thank our system manager mr chandan for providing technical support thank you one and all thank you sir uh, thank